Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, for our digital day of action on the right to food. Um, before we get into it, I just want to start by acknowledging that a lot of us, including myself, are joining from Toronto, um, sacred land that is the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. Um, at Future, we think it's important to start any conversation on this land by recognizing the many nations of Indigenous people who currently live on this land, um, those who've spent time here, and all of the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this land. I also want to acknowledge the many people of African descent who are not settlers, but whose ancestors were forcibly displaced as part of the transatlantic slave trade and brought against their will and made to work on these lands. At Foodshare, we believe that advancing Indigenous sovereignty is deeply and inextricably linked to Black liberation, and we're committed to advancing both. So when we talk about the right to food, I think it's really important to recognize that indigenous land sovereignty needs to be at the foundation of any future in which our right to food is realized. Um, so as we think about moving land acknowledgements from words to action, I invite all of you to take a moment just to reflect on the land you're situated on and the ways in which those of us who are settlers can support the process of reconciliation in our own lives. Okay, thank you. So I also want to make a few notes on the logistics of this event. Um, so for closed captions, you can click the CC icon at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. Um, I want to say thank you to Jocelyn for providing ASL interpretation today. Um, you can hide non-video participants and pin her square to ensure that she's visible to you throughout the event. Um, and due to the fact that we'd like, like to keep the event to under an hour, um, we won't be having a Q&A portion for today, but feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself and engage in discussion throughout the event. Um, and this will be recorded and posted to Foodshare's YouTube channel uh, with closed captions for whoever wants to revisit the conversation or if you want to share it with others who can't join us today. And finally, a big thank you to Foodshare staff, Peter, Andrea, and Renee for supporting this call. Um, yeah, and with that, I'm gonna pass it off to my very amazing colleague, Hansel, to get us started. Thank you, Mo. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for our Digital Day of Action on the Right to Food. I'm Hansel Igbawa, my pronouns are he, him, um, and, and the Right to Food Campaign Coordinator here at Foodshare. Um, so I'm going to start today off by just providing a brief timeline of some recent updates on our campaign, um, just kind of like a timeline of like where we started from and where we're going. So we launched this campaign back in October, calling on the city to update the Toronto Food Charter, um, which unanimously passed or was adopted um, by the Toronto City Council in 2001. Um, the charter highlights the city's commitment to building a food secure city, um, but 20 years later, we're still fighting for the right to food. We shared receipts that highlighted facts that we know about the state of food insecurity in the city, like one in five households are food insecure, and food insecurity disproportionately impacts Black and Indigenous households. We know that existing food chart, um, the existing food charter is inadequate in addressing barriers to impact our access to food. Um, and that's why we're calling on the City of Toronto to support the development of a new Toronto Food Charter that's reading, written by communities who are impacted by food insecurity. Um, so this requires centering folks who are working to transform and defend um, food rights of the communities and those who experience the most barriers in our food system. So Black, Indigenous, racialized people, people with disabilities, people living on low income, workers and renters. Um, we're also calling for the city to include a mechanism to ensure the city is accountable um, to its commitment under the new Toronto Food Charter. 
and also for the city to allocate sufficient funding and resources to realize the right to food in Toronto. So we also held a town hall last year with leaders from community grassroots organizations to discuss what it means um, and what it will take to realize the right to food in Toronto. If you would like to you know, see a recap of that, you can check out YouTube um, page. Um, since this year, we've since since the end of last year, we launched a campaign and a petition. We've had over eleven thousand signatures. Um, so thank you to many of you who are here today, who have signed and shared the petition, um, who have donated to Food Share and all the local organizations doing food justice work in the communities and have taken the time to support this campaign. Last week, we had the opportunity to meet with Councillor Joe Cressy of Ward 10 Spadina Fort York. Um, Councillor Cressy notified us that he will be moving the motion to the Economic and Community Development Committee on March 24, which was last week. Um, and he directed staff to initiate that process. So it was passed um, at the, the committee um, and Future was able to offer input in the wording of that motion. So, you know, <laughs> we've had a big win. Um, and as a result of the community taking collective action and applying pressure on, on decision makers, um, that was what made it possible for that motion to be passed in, in committee. And it will be moving on to the council on April 6th. Um, so now is the perfect time for us to rally around this motion. And that's why we're here today. Um, and we need to keep the momentum going, um, but we're gonna get to that later on in this event. Um, first of all, before we get into the zap portion and emailing counselors and, and the fun part of it all, I mean, it's all fun actually really, um, this event is in collaboration with Birch Mountain Community Action Council and Dietitians for Food Justice. So we're joined here today by Laura Hammond and Nadia Pabani. So I'm just gonna give a quick um, bio of each of our speakers today, um, and then we're just gonna go um, right into the discussion. So Laura Hammond is a community leader and a co-founder of the Birch Mountain Community Action Council and the Director of Operations for Frontline Connections. She's also an urban farmer, a beekeeper, a Teal um, Ravens champion, and a mom of six. Laura established the Action Council with neighbors in her Toronto community housing building as a response to well, no response when it came to support for residents. Nadia Pabani is a Toronto-based dietitian and health justice advocate that is passionate about food justice, community engagement, and health equity. She's a co-founder of Dietitians for Food Justice, a group that aims to ad um, address food injustices through advocacy, education, social action, and um, policy change. Currently, she works as a community dietitian at the Regent Park Community Health Center. Um, so, give a warm welcome to our speakers for today. Um, I'm just gonna go straight into the questions because we don't have much time. Um, <laughs> and yeah, our speakers will have the opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, so I'm just gonna start with you, Laura. So Birchmount Community Action Council, um, I know does a lot of work when it comes to community building, um, including food distribution, programming for youth and seniors, mental, um, wellness programs and, and a lot more. Can you give us a short overview of your work and, and touching your approach to food insecurity as the result you know, of a broader systemic barrier for low-income racialized communities? Sure, yes, and thanks for the introduction, Hansel. Uh, so Birchmont Community Action Council takes a resident-led approach to food programming and pretty much all of our community programs. Um, whether we have the talent within the community, we'll source from within. And an example of that is um, our past community dinners, um, our beekeeping program that you mentioned, and as well as our community gardening program. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Yeah. Um, so Nadia, Dietitians for Food Justice brings together, um, you know, folks who have knowledge and nutrition to challenge the status quo on our relationships and access to food. 
um, speaking on how it's informed by other harmful systems like anti-Black racism and barriers to housing and so on. Um, for those who are just learning about the organization, tell us what you do and why it is important to have a food justice lens when it comes to your work. So thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, so Dietitians for Food Justice is a group of not just dietitians, but um, interns as well as nutrition students, uh, again, who, who are very committed to this, this um, idea of, of addressing food injustices and that it should be a core, core responsibility that uh, dietitians take on. Um, because, you know, we claim to be these experts in nutrition, but without actually ensuring that everyone has the right to food, we can't do our jobs well. Um, so historically, one of the reasons why we were created is because historically um, the field of dietetics has always been a very white space and often lacked a lot of the intersectional conversations that we know are necessary around race, gender, disability, among many other issues and concerns. Um, and this has both impacted, you know, the type of care our clients receive, but also the type of initiatives and also uh, policy change that we see. Uh, we came together pretty recently about um, two, just over a little, two years ago. Um, and I, I think personally, um, one of the reasons why we came together and, and decided to create this group is because, you know, in our education and throughout um, the whole process of training, we're taught that there's these discrepancies around chronic diseases when it relates to um, different peoples of color and how uh, they can differ from, from, you know, white people. And we're taught as if it is a biological issue um, and never really making that direct link to um, the fact that those social um, underlying causes are very real and very, very much connected to why we see those discrepancies. So we're taught that food insecurity is a, an important determinant of health, but we're not taught things uh, that make the direct connection like uh, that Black and brown peoples or indigenous peoples are often employed in precarious work or get paid less than dot, dot, dot. All of these things sort of lead to why these discrepancies exist in the first place. Um, and so I think that that really motivated us to come together and bring a lot of these topics to the main conversation in dietetics and beyond. And we really want to be that resource for not just dietitians, but especially dietitians to make those connections for people um, and, and make it make it a core part of why we do the work we are doing um, is also taking the responsibility, responsibility to ensure that um, the populations we serve have access to their right of food. And I think that's why it's so important for us to be involved in initiatives like this. So thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you, Nadia. I think just still on, on the same, you know, Wavelength. Um, can you talk about the importance of you know having an updated food charter, um, and why this type of commitment from the city is important, um, especially relating to the work you do? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, you know, as you said, our current charter is you know over twenty years old, and there's still like a lot in there that's good, but there are you know major gaps um, that we need to make sure that we're filling. Um, and I think the, the most important one um, that I, I think needs to be addressed is the fact that we need to acknowledge the fact that colonialism, capitalism, white supremacy, um, and peak jerky continue to be um, continue to be the main ways in which our food systems are shaped. And that that really dictates who is left hungry or are not able to access food and who is in control of the food systems. And I think that part of what a, a new food charter and the ways that the food charter needs to be updated is redistributing that power um, to people who are most impacted, to community members to help design, design, decide and control the food system um, in order for us to fix some of the problems that we're, we're seeing in terms of racism, in terms of ableism, in terms of all, all those isms and, and systems of oppression that we're seeing in the food system right now. Um, I think, I think, um, by updating our food charter to ensure that it includes um, that acknowledgement, we, we also need to recognize that food security does not 
affect all of us the same in a city and that a one size fits all approach is not going to benefit us <laughs> and we need to we need to recognize that that there are certain communities in our city that uh, require more resources there are certain areas in the city that require more resources and that we need to have an equitable equitable approach when we're talking about this food charter to make sure that um that the people who need extra resources in order to be able to see their right to food realized are receiving them and so i think that's a really big part of what um is important about the food food charter is that it has the power to help define what that equitable approach will be how do we reach those populations that might need more resources um and what are the principles on which we are we are moving forward with this and i think i think an important piece of that process is like as you said centering um the voices of the people who are most impacted by food insecurity and food injustice um i also think it's really important for the city to be doing this work because it's really important for them um uh to be defining um how are the funding that comes from the city the purchasing power the time and energy that is related to food is spent and is spent on initiatives um that that will then trickle down and make sure that we're we're reaching the populations that we need to be reaching um i think one of the the concrete ways that we could see this benefit the populations would be you know even currently we're seeing that black and indigenous led food sovereignty initiatives are really struggling to access resources from the city are really struggling through the bureaucracy of the city and so ensuring that our plan incorporates um our, our charter sorry incorporates a, a way of addressing some of these 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 clear barriers to um these important initiatives re getting resources it could be a part of what our charter incorporates mm -hmm. i am also very hopeful sorry this is the last thing <laughs> i'm also very hopeful that the city might be able to move from a charity based model or a more reliant charity based model towards a rights based model yeah thank you um nadia um and then now over to you laura um i personally know you've been organizing and doing you know a lot of um capacity building work within the community um for a really long time even you know prior to birch mount or prior to, to you know the coalition of front lines um when you think about some of the obstacles you face um from the city in the past and and what kind of impact you hope that um, an updated and enforceable food charter um, may have on your work? And what are some of the things you worry when it comes to this process? Yeah, so um, just in one word, access. Some of the barriers um, that have just been so overwhelming to overcome is like the red tape and uh, what is seen as like a procedure in order to access land has really been um, a barrier at times. And also, I think that like the city has a lot of the right ideas because there's been a lot of consultation around food um, and they have a lot of direction from residents, whether it be from the neighborhood action planning tables or actual specialized committees that have been designed to do this work. I think it's about actually um, really rolling out the plan. Um, in a way that limits the barriers and like very much of what Nadia mentioned, ensuring that those who are most vulnerable are at the forefront of that. Um, because oftentimes what I have seen in my work and even I have some current day examples um, right now of residents who've mobilized, done the planning and built partnership. And then when it comes to accessing, accessing the space, it's again, a lot of the red tape. And I'll give an example of what I mean by the red tape. Um, applications and permits and sometimes a lack of response to those um, applications and permits, um, whether it be a, a staffing or a capacity issue that really hinders community on the forefront in the sense where, you know, once you rally community and you have everyone excited, that takes a lot of work. But then as leaders, you have a weight put on you to deliver right um, nobody likes to speak and not be heard and i think it's really important um, to be very intentional um, and also for the opportunities that we have to support economic development which we know that will lead right back to impacting food security through social procurement so i can only imagine like to see a project 
rolled out where uh, community uh, or groups are given access to space to grow food abundantly and then be allowed to provide economic development from that. The notion that you cannot sell food from a community garden, you must just, I guess, consume it or give it away, it is something that really needs to be changed. And I hope this charter can address that. You know, um, once you have created something with your own hands, you should be able to do with it as you please, uh, or more intentional efforts should be given to those who are low income, who are vulnerable, to have access to these plots so that they can support their economic needs, right? Um, and sorry, the last part of that question um, was, can you repeat that again, just so? Yeah, it's kind of like, what are you wary about when it comes yeah. to the process of even updating the charter? Yes, um, just wary, uh, wary about it not having enough bones. Um, you know, things can sound really good on paper, but then going through the process in person, you know, we want to really ensure that there's very limited obstacles. And I think even starting with those that have already been consulted, that have I have been identified as vulnerable groups um, really get put to the forefront um, or even working with, alongside organizations who are doing food work who can um, point out grassroots groups who have the capacity to do the work it, it needs to be very intentional and, and i have to really highlight that so access and intention out of this food charter can really address the food security issues because it's not a, it's not a the issue of there not being space. There is space. It's just the allocation of that space to address these issues um, needs to really be uh, something that's taken into consideration. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, so going on to the last question, I, I think I would just like piggyback off what you said, like with action and intention, um, what can the future of our food system really look like? What are we hopeful in terms of um, Toronto's food system, either in policy or just even imagining what it could look like um, day to day or in our communities? Um, we can start with you, Laura. And sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? I can imagine a space uh, similar to, let's give an example of, say, the golf club. Um, uh, project where, you know, I, food share was at the forefront of asking for some of these spaces to be, you know, turned into food hubs and for it to be a space to grow food. I imagine a, a space where recreation and food security are treated equally. Um, I, even though personally, I think one outweighs the other. Um, I think there's room for, you know, joint models for that to be approached. So I think that, um, in doing a lot of the engagement work and speaking to so many residents, I know the city is really big in consultation. We still have to take uh, an objective approach to understanding what needs need to be balanced and what their overall greater impact is on our system um, if there's a lack thereof. So, yeah, so I'm really hoping for, again, that intention and for flexible models that, you know, suit the needs of the haves and have nots and uh, really take a sincere approach. Nadia? Um, yeah, I guess, I, I think the piece that I'm really hopeful for, for um, around this charter is, is the plan that seems to be being called for that's in conjunction with, with the charter, which which I think will help make sure that there's accountability at the, the government level at making things um, happen. So not just being a charter on its own, which is static, but actually having a plan attached to it, which will hold them accountable, but also um, ensure that, that the, the charter becomes enacted and is an aesthetic document. So I'm hopeful of that. I'm also hopeful, um, I know that this is like a starting step towards um, a much larger conversation around food, food rights, not just even in Toronto alone, but, you know, beyond that. And I know that our work at Dietitians for Food Justice is really focused on not, uh, bringing it, you know, to the provincial level, to other cities, and also federally, to ensure that the right to food is something that's realized across the country. So that that's definitely the, the couple of things that I'm hopeful for. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think I'm I'm definitely hopeful for the same things, or and 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 we hope that 
today we can really pressure um, the city council to move forward with this process. So thank you for, um, both for joining us here today. Um, for everyone on the call or watching, um, you can learn more about Laura's work with the Birch Mountain Community Action Council at like www.actioncouncil.net. And also you can keep up with the Dietitians for Food Justice um, on socials at Dietitians for Food Justice on IG and RDS, the number four Food Justice on Twitter. Um, it's a bit complicated, but um, <laughs> it will be posted in the chat and, and we can share some of the stuff with, with everyone who's here today. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Laura, quickly, like, is there any social media um, you would also like us to, to shout out today? Uh, yes, um, so we do have a Frontlines Connection um, IG. I believe it's Frontline Connections, but I will send it to you, Hansel, just so I don't get it right. I don't cover the social media stuff. And um, just really quickly, I don't know if I mentioned them earlier, but Frontlines Connections is our grassroots network of passionate community leaders. Um, across the GTA. A lot of the work is done in Scarborough around food distribution, but our other uh, pillars are uh, economic development and um, community engagement. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on. Um, sorry. Now we're going to move on to the action piece. Um, we've had the opportunity to hear, um, you know, about a new food charter, what it could mean for some people doing the work to defend our food rights um, of the communities. Um, it's time for us to take collective action. Um, so we're going to let the city council know that we want to support the motion to update the food charter on April 6th. Um, so that's like next week coming up. So. On the screen, you see three actions you can take. Um, I don't know if it's been put up on the screen now. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, and you for for those who are registered um, for this event through Eventbrite, um, we sent we we sent out an email. Um, of the Digital Day Action Toolkit um, for you. And, and if you can't find it in your email or for those watching on the live stream, um, you can also find it at foodshare.net forward slash right to food. Um, the details of each one, including the contact info for our counselors. So firstly, you can call your counselors, um, counselor um, or the mayor's office. We've prepared a phone script to make things easy. Um, especially if this is your first time engaging in this type of action. Um, so it's something that you can expect is that many of the calls we're going to make today um, might, you know, go to voicemail um, and that's okay. Um, if it does go to voicemail, um, you know, we, we encourage you to just leave um, a voicemail. Um, and if you're calling to the, the counselor, um, it's helpful that you acknowledge that you're your constituents, so like that you live in the ward. Um, and honestly, if you're feeling like it, you can also call, you know, other counselors um, outside your ward. Um, second, you can head to our website as well, foodshare.net slash forward slash right to food um, and use our emailing tool to send an email to the city councillors, the mayor and the secretariat to add your voice to the record in advance of the council meeting April 6th. Um, so you're free to edit the text of the email tool to personalize it to you know, how you want it. But while you do that, um, it's important to keep the agenda item number um, and the name in the email text because that's important for it um, to go to public record. And thirdly, you can use Twitter to send a tweet to your mayor, um, to the mayor, Tory, um, and to city councillors. Um, you find their Twitter handles in the toolkit as well. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe um, also on our Instagram social media, on our link tree, you should be able to see, um, find a link to our website. So to the toolkit on our website, 
um, on our link tree. So if you're on Instagram or if you're able to go on Instagram or if you're watching from Instagram, you can click through the link to find um, this toolkit. So it has all the instructions that you need to either call your counselors, email the counselors. Um, and once you're done, we'll be really, uh, we'll really appreciate if you could fill out the form at the bottom of the toolkit to help us keep track of your impact together. Um, so we have about 15 minutes to do this, actually slightly more than 15 minutes um, to do this. Um, so we're going to be back around 1247. Um, oh, I think I might be, <laughs> I might be saying the time wrong. So we have till 1255 PM. Um, to, um, to do the calls. Okay, um, I can see in the chat that a lot of people, um, you know, have been able to make calls and send emails. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us here today. Um, at Future Within Collective Action is an incredibly, incredibly important way to approach securing our right to food. Um, and we appreciate you for making the time to let the city know that you support um, an updated food charter. If you didn't get a chance to email or make a phone call, um, we're encouraging you to take action all throughout today and for the rest of the week um, as the motion goes to council next Wednesday. Um, thank you to our speakers, Laura Hammond from Birch Mountain Community Action Council um, and Nadia Pabani from Dietitians for Food Justice. Um, please take a minute to support the work. The links will be in the chat. Um, and keep up with the future updates and actions on the right to food by following us on our social media at FoodShareTO on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And you can also check our website um, at foodshare.net forward slash right to food. Um, again, thank you everyone um, for, for joining us in this collective action today. Have a great day.